Welcome to Biz Hope For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. There always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now, you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here is your host, Candy Messer. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show, 10 Key Things Buyers and Investors Look For When Assessing Your Business, informative. If you were unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, Links are located on my YouTube page and Facebook pages, as well as iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. If there are topics you'd find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to us at media at abnp.com. Now let's learn a little bit more about our guest today, Candy Messer. She's usually the ones doing the, one doing this show, so we're just <laughs> turning the tables a little bit here. Um, Candy Messer is a profitability growth advisor working with entrepreneurs in service-based industries to help them have successful businesses. With more than 22 years of experience in the industry, Candy understands the stresses business owners face and offers customized services to meet their varying needs. Candy started Affordable Bookkeeping and Payroll, ABNP, with the goal of providing businesses with top-notch bookkeeping and payroll services at a reasonable price. Her company energizes business owners by removing the burden of compliance tasks, as well as working with them to identify issues preventing higher profitability and or growth. As a result of using her services, clients have peace of mind and the freedom to do what they love. Candy is co-author of Business Success with Ease and Navigating Entrepreneurship and is the host of Biz Help For You, which can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. So, Candy, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and how you began your company? Sure. So some people may know my story if they've been clients of ours for a little bit, um, but a lot don't know that I actually never intended to be a business owner. I, you know, for, my degree, I do have a business management degree. I went into retail, my first real job when I was 17 and then stayed there until I was about to give birth to my son and then decided to stay home for a few years. When I got back into working, I was a full charge bookkeeper at a publishing company, but I still wanted to have somewhat freedom, you know, in my schedule to work with my kids. So I was working part-time and I was at home with my kids um, and volunteering in their classes and things. Um, but my mom loved to brag about her kids and would always talk about what I did. And her nail manicurist said, hey, my husband has a business and I hate reconciling and I hate, you know, doing some of the things that the business requires. I'll pay the bills and I'll invoice the client, but will you help me? And she actually bugged me for a few months until I finally agreed. And at that point, I, you know, want to do everything legally. So I had to get a business license. And at the time I lived in a city that required a separate home operating permit. And it wasn't going to make sense for me to just help her and pay those fees. So I looked for a few clients to help quote unquote on the side of my real job, you know, and after about a year and a half or so, my husband said, you know, people love what you do. Why don't you quit your quote unquote real job and help those clients and build your business. And so that's what I did. And I left that job in 2004. I started in actually 2002, left my job in 2004. And here we are now with the company Affordable Bookkeeping and a staff that's willing to work with me to build the dream, to help our clients do the things that they don't want to do, but they need to. So that's my story. That's wonderful. It's funny how it starts out with not being intentional. Right. Exactly. And on doing this and now here we are, you know, that's great. Um, before we begin to discuss the forgiveness process, can you touch on what the PPP loan requires in terms of what the money is allowed to be used for? 
Sure. So some people may remember that in uh, April when they were able to apply for the PPP loan, originally it said you had to spend 75% of the amount funded on payroll and 25% on approved non-payroll costs. And then that actually changed later on um, in June when the PPP Flexibility Act was passed, it's now 75, I'm sorry, it was 75%, it's now 60% payroll and 40% approved non-payroll costs, which non-payroll costs are basically utilities, mortgage interest, uh, rent or lease payments, anything that was actually in service as of February 15th of this year, um, can qualify and then payroll costs include not only the salaries and wages but the medical expense paid by the company not the employee portion but the paid by the company same thing if there's a 401k match for the employee's retirement that is also deductible as well as state or local payroll taxes but not the federal tax and um, so basically, as long as they have met those requirements, then they potentially could have forgiveness on that full amount. It's definitely very helpful, that, sh that shift to 60-40. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other thing I didn't mention was at first when it began, it was an eight week period. And then with the PPP Flexibility Act, it was changed to be up to a 24 week period. So anyone that originally applied kind of in the first round, uh, if they were granted at that eight weeks, they actually have the option of 24 week period. But those who were um, granted after the PPP Flexibility Act, it's only a 24 week period. Mm -hmm. right. So I know in that um, description of, of the PPP. Um, you did bring up some payroll and non-payroll costs, what's allowable. Do you have any more that you can clarify, um, whether, you know, more specifically yep. payroll, more specifically non? Sure. So some of the things that will be included also in compensation would include uh, not again, the, just the regular pay as well for their hourly or salary, but if they have sick pay, if they had vacation pay, if they earned commissions, uh, if they were laid off, then um, they had a severance package that would also be included in that payroll amount. Um, and again, the non payroll approved amounts are those things that were in place as of February 15th of 2020 that includes like the rent or lease payments if they were paying lease on equipment so sometimes people were renting like one of those large copy machines that would be deductible um, utilities so gas electricity telephone internet um, and automotive uh, expenses also for like transportation costs um, can also be included in those non-payroll costs. Now with that 60-40 uh, split, it seems like it covers a whole lot between mm -hmm. you know, payroll and non-payroll, but are there any exclusions to what can be deducted between, you know, it seems pretty cut and dry, but are there any exclusions to that? Sure, so one of the issues is there may be some workers that made more than $100,000 on an annual basis, but you can only account for up to that 100,000 and it's based on, again, the pay period that they are falling under. So if they're on the eight week uh, period and they're gonna file for that eight week period, then the maximum is basically if you take the 100,000 divided by 52 weeks gives you a weekly rate times eight, which would give you that $15,384 maximum compensation. If they're gonna file on that 24 week period, uh, then basically they're gonna have 46,153 that is able to be written off. So if they're earning any more than that in that period, whether the eight week or 24 week period, then the excess cannot be written off and has to be excluded. Um, also, if anyone is paid as an independent contractor, they do not fall under this um, because they could have applied for themselves for a PPP loan. So if you're going to pay anyone who is an independent contractor, you cannot include them. And all of the recipients must be US residents. So if you're paying anyone that's not a US resident, that also cannot be included in your uh, payroll costs. 
Um, how long does someone have to apply for forgiveness before it becomes a loan? So this also changed. Uh, originally, the uh, deferral was six months, and at the end of the six months, and that was from the date of funding. Um, at this point now, it says you have 10 months to apply from the date of funding. Now, if you have 10 months to apply, you basically then also have to wait for the bank to determine if they're going to recommend that you have the full forgiveness. Uh, and then the SBA also has to then say if they're going to approve that or not. So it could take, uh, you know, a, a large amount of time actually after that 10 months um, for you to actually find out how much is forgiven. And if any of it is not forgiven, then that would become a loan and become, you know, payable over time. Which kind of brings me to my next question. If a portion of it does remain a loan, how long does... Um, how long does that business have to pay it back? So again, this also changed and um, those who originally applied kind of in the beginning and were under the original PPP uh, application process were told that they had two years to pay that back at the 1% interest. Again, when the PPP Flexibility Act was passed, it changed it to five years. So those who originally received their uh, amounts, you know, a lot of people are saying that it probably just automatically becomes five years, but I've also seen that it's up to the lender and the borrower to negotiate that into the five-year loan. I don't see that that would be a problem with the bank, uh, but it sounds like you probably still need to go to your bank if you have a loan and say, well, I originally applied, you know, in April of 2020, it was originally a two-year loan and I would like to have that turn into a five-year loan. Okay. So with the application itself, it sort of comes off as a one and done situation. Like I have my application, let's provide this information. Um, is that really the case? Are there different applications? Who can use which applications? Can you shed some light on that? I guess this has been an interesting process watching this all happen as well too because of course, when COVID-19 hit, uh, the government was doing what they could to just kind of get aid out there as quickly as possible. And so originally the application was just one application. Everyone was going to use the same application and you had to certify that your full-time equivalents hadn't decreased. Again, you were supposed to prove you'd use the funds you know, within the eight weeks. You had to certify that you did not reduce any employees' wages more than 25%, and it would have been a long process, including a schedule that had to be filled out for each employee on your books that was paid in that period of time. Then a little while ago, maybe a two months ago or so, another one was, uh, release that was called the 3508 EZ. And the EZ form basically said, if you can certify you didn't, you know, re re uh, reduce your full-time equivalents or the compensation more than 25%, or if you're, you're your sole proprietor and it was only you, you had no employees, or if you fall under the safe harbor, which uh, we can talk about also in, um, a little bit as well what safe harbor means um, but if you can check one of those three boxes then you would fill out the 3508 easy it was a little less complicated than the schedule a that you had to list every employee and what they had earned early in the year and what they've learned earned since um, and then about two or three weeks ago uh, they released now the 3508 s which basically says if your loan was $50,000 or less, uh, that you could then use that application and you don't even need to certify now that you didn't reduce your full-time equivalents. You'll still have to use all the supporting documentation to show what you paid, again, on the payroll costs and the non-payroll costs, but it's less tedious than having to do the work that is still required on the other application. So now there are basically three different applications Depending on your situation, you will use one of those three. So PPP has become, from the beginning of this year to here, an ever-evolving process. So and it kind of seems like there is room for possible error if people aren't informed. 
Um, there, you know, the different numbers thrown around, right. the different types of forms thrown around. Um, so in order to clarify, because I know this is something that even stumps me when I'm looking mm -hmm. over PPP, is how does a business owner determine the covered period to use? Yes. So again, if we go back to when it originally was put out there with an eight-week period, that eight-week period started from the day of funding. Uh, but they said if you had a weekly or a bi-weekly pay period, you could adjust that pay date um, or the covered period to be an alternate covered period, which would be the first day of your payroll cycle. So for instance, if you were funded on a Friday, but your pay period, the next pay date was going to be on Monday, you could actually shift for those few days to be when that next pay period was going to begin and go from there. So you'd have a payroll alternate covered period. The supporting documents for your non-payroll costs would have still fallen under the actual covered period, and that would have been eight weeks. Again, with the PPP Flexibility Act that now changed it to 24 weeks, uh, that obviously has extended it. Instead of two months, it's now basically six months is the covered period. So it seems like there's just a little bit of room for grace, <laughs> that small, <laughs> tiny little bit there. Mm -hmm. Well, this actually um, came about, you know, because so many businesses had to close. And I believe that the expectation was they would be closed for a short period of time. So the goal was to be able to keep the employees on payroll guarantee that they are getting paid pretty much what they had been paid before. And, you know, that was the purpose of the funds. Many businesses were not even able to open as of the eight weeks. And some of my clients even now haven't been able to open yet as we are in LA County and specific industries are still completely shut down. So there had to be a plan to adjust for the fact that they had used funds, but they couldn't certify that it was for payroll because they didn't have payroll on staff you know they didn't have their employees that could be earning what they could or even if they were keeping them on staff they weren't paying probably a hundred percent and so that's where the flexibility act came in to give extra you know time for the covered period as well as extra uh, time for the um, paying back the loan and reducing the maximum that had to be uh, spent for the non-payroll costs versus using that 75 percent changing to 60 percent for the actual payroll compensation. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned during this discussion a few times, um, like the term FTE, what does that mean? Sure, so FTE stands for full-time equivalents. So basically a full-time person is considered one who works 40 hours, but many businesses don't have employees that always work the 40 hours. It might be somebody is part-time because they're attending school or it could be a restaurant that they you know have shorter shifts so the person doesn't have to work an eight-hour shift and take lunch and, and worry about the lunches so what you do when you calculate your full-time equivalents is you take basically everyone that's worked for the period that you're looking at you add up all of their hours and then you divide that by 40 and that gives you basically a full-time equivalent so if you have two people working 20 hours each that's one full-time equivalent so when you're calculating this, you're going to, for each person even, if you have to calculate that, again, if you have the large um, application that you might have to say, this is what they worked before, this is what they worked after, you would take their total hours in the covered period and divide um, to determine what their, uh, their ratio is. If it comes out to be more than one, you just max it at one. Um, but it could be anywhere up from, you know, 0 0.01 all the way up to one to determine each person's ratio. Um, and then that would be the full-time equivalent. So again, it's basically just how many people would make up a 40 hour shift in that covered period. And so you could have 20 people on payroll, but you might only have, you know, 10 full-time equivalents or seven full-time equivalents or, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So in, in my mind, just hearing that, it sounds like the amount of FTEs directly impact how large, you know, your loan forgiveness amount is. Are there instances where a reduction in FTE would not impact, you know, and reduce the forgiveness amount? Sure, so there are some situations where, again, the original intent of this PPP, the Paycheck Protection Plan, 
was to keep employees on the books, earning their normal compensation, even if they were unable to work. But you might have some situations where you weren't able to meet that requirement and the full-time equivalence number dropped. Um, one reason could be somebody was offered the opportunity to come back to work if you had closed and you offered them the opportunity to come back and they decided not to. Um, as long as you offered them in writing and you have proof that they have declined that rehire offer, that is not held against you. It could also be that you may not have been able to find someone similarly skilled to fill that position. So if you have something, say you need a machinist and you weren't able to find someone to do that duty yet, then that would not be held against you because you have to have someone qualified to do that job. Um, if you had to terminate for cause, you know, then that also uh, would not be held against you. And then because so many industries have had requirements for social distancing or maximum capacity, um, things like that, if they have to follow any laws that were passed by the CDC or OSHA, um, the Department of Health, and they you know, can't have the capacity they had before, that also would not be held against them. So as long as they can show one of those you know, reasons is why their full-time equivalence is less now than it was earlier, um, then they're okay. They also still have through the end of this year to get to that full-time equivalent number. So if they don't mm -hmm. fall under the safe harbor, but they can get back to the full-time equivalence number by December 31st, then they have um, the ability to still have that forgiveness and not have that penalty. Because part of the PPP basically said if they reduced their hours um, or their compensation to be less than it was originally as of the February 15th number, that forgiveness amount um, would be adjusted. So again, if someone had a $50,000 loan and they did not maintain their FTEs, then based on that ratio that they reduced it by, their forgiveness would be affected by that same ratio. Um, but with the safe harbor, they still can potentially have that full forgiveness. That's good to hear. That was actually something I was gonna ask about because I'm sure that's something our listeners deal with. You know, <laughs> turnover during this, this time is very difficult um, right. where they've lost workers and you know, they're freaking out because now it's like what I reported isn't exactly <laughs> what I have now, so that was very helpful. Um, so we've talked about the application, we've talked about amounts, we've talked about safe harbor, we've talked about um, a whole laundry load, you know, a laundry list of things. Uh, can you talk to us about how does somebody apply for forgiveness? Sure, so they, there is a misconception that you apply directly with the SBA. Now the SBA is the one who you know, has basically distributed the funds, but you had to use a lender to apply. So you actually must apply for forgiveness through your lender. Um, I know some banks have already opened their portals, um, but some have not. I know I have a couple clients who've reached out to me who wanted to start the process and the banks have told them it probably will be closer to the beginning of the year before they open that. And most likely that's due to, again, this third application being released recently and they need to make sure that their portals are ready. But with that said, I've actually had a few banks that are accepting the process and an email has been sent to the customer saying you need to create a link a, or a login basically with the link that they have. And then when you log in, each bank has its own portal. So this is not across the board like the SBA didn't create it and each one has the same. So the few that I've actually started the process for, for my clients, I've actually seen differences. But basically when you log in, there's gonna be information you have to fill in, whether it's a spreadsheet that you complete and you upload, or they will have some fields that you will fill in um, to say the date of funding, you know, what was the amount of payroll. Again, depending on the situation, you might have to fill in all of the employee information. Um, and once you fill that out, it will say, you know, well, here's the number that you received for your funding. And then based on the information you're provided, it looks like you should receive you know, X amount for forgiveness. Now, at this point, one thing we did not touch on 
is when the PPP became available, there was another loan that became available also. That was the Economic Impact Disaster Loan called the EIDL, E-I-D-L. And basically the SBA has said, if you received an advance from that, so again, everyone who applied originally had $1,000 per employee as an advance. If you receive that advance, that amount is not forgivable. So if you had $9,000 in your idle advance, your forgiveness would be reduced by that 9,000. But basically it will look at your information that you submit and say, based on everything we see right now, it looks like you would be able to receive X dollars in forgiveness as long as everything is supported. It, they can you know, prove everything and then report that to the SBA. What I'm seeing then too are where there are folders for each type of documentation. So it will say, you know, here's where you need to upload your payroll information, which would include payroll journals for the period, the covered period, whether it's that eight weeks or the 24 weeks that shows every employee, their compensation. You'd also have to upload the documentation for payroll reports, including the federal 941 and the quarterly state reports. And um, they often are asking as well for proof of those tax payments. So your bank statements highlighted. One of the ones that I've seen said, just from the payroll company, if there's a listing of the tax payments made, that was okay. Uh, but one bank specifically wanted the bank statements highlighted with every deduction for the payroll um, when it was direct deposit, you know, highlighting that amount, the tax payments highlighting that amount. So again, each bank may have specific rules you have to follow. One other thing I've noticed, uh, the banks also have different ways that the information is being submitted. So one of the bank portals I was in you basically had to upload everything at once. So either it didn't allow you to kind of start the process and save your documentation and come back. You either, if you didn't have everything ready to go, you lost whatever you had already uploaded or you had to mark it complete. So if you marked it complete and later on you realized you forgot a document, you couldn't actually upload it into that folder anymore. So it's very important to really review each bank what their process is and make sure that you have everything ready in case you have to upload it all at once so that you don't miss out uploading the specific documentation you need. And again, they have, I've seen different folders for the different types. So if you have your non-payroll costs, that goes in a folder. If you have your payroll costs, that goes into a folder. And then one of them had specific folders even for each one had utilities was one folder, rent was one folder, you know, so just looking at your bank portal and understanding how they want the information to support your loan forgiveness is important. So it seems like an ever-changing process where they're kind of just feeling it out as it goes. Definitely. And, you know, it's, it can be frustrating working with their portals because it seems like sometimes it takes a while to get everything loaded. One that I had for a, a client that has a very large loan and a lot of documentation only allows you to upload one document at a time instead of if you're used to like an email, you can sometimes say go to a folder and highlight, you know, I want these five documents and add them at once. Um, so having a check sheet to make sure you actually load everything if you have to do one at a time is important too because again, you don't really want to miss anything that would show that you qualify for that. Um, one of the things that's good news though is if you originally thought you had to spend it in the eight weeks and you now have 24 weeks, that the amount of payroll cost is probably enough on its own to justify full forgiveness. So if you do miss like a supporting document for like a utility bill or rent or things like that, most likely it won't affect your forgiveness if you have used that 24 week period. It's more important if you're really using that eight week period and you definitely need those costs to help meet that amount that you had spent. So there is a lot included in that. And okay. especially with that client, I know exactly who you're talking about. Um, with this being an ever working process, they're constantly working on it. I mean, COVID is still a thing. It's still affecting what's going on pretty much everywhere. Um, have they released kind of a timeline of when 
a business can know how much is forgiven yet. I know you've mentioned a few times being like, well, you can submit what you can submit, but right. they're going to take time on their end. So is there a more refined, shortened timeline that they've updated and given to anyone you know of? Sure. What I've seen at this point is Banks will have 60 days once you have submitted your application to them to review and then recommend to the SBA the amount of forgiveness. Once the SBA receives it, they have 90 days uh, to come back and say, this is the amount that will be forgiven. And so you're basically looking at an additional five months. Now, depending on how many people are submitting at one time, I don't know if the banks would actually, with the staff that they have, be able to actually meet that 60 day requirement. So it'll be interesting to see if that date changes, especially if people are delaying, you know, later into that 10 month period, you know, there's only so many people working at the bank. So it'll be interesting to see, but technically as it is right now, once you submit to the bank, they have 60 days and the SBA has 90. So you deal with businesses who have had to shut down for a period of time. And just as a consumer, you're walking around seeing small businesses that are either still shut down, um, closing down, or you can just tell that they really need like an influx of money. Mm -hmm. um, so they're shoring up their financials, they're saving here and there. I mean, even, I mean, fast food restaurants have taken a lot off of menus just to consolidate what they have and maximize that. Right. Is there like a timeline or how long can a business owner wait to start paying on that loan um, so that it's not, they received the loan and then, okay, great. Now start paying it back to us. Um, yeah. how, how, how long can they wait? Right. So as we said before, they really have 10 months from the time that they were funded. Um, actually, well, the end of the covered period, actually. So instead of just saying the funded, they basically have 10 months to apply for forgiveness. And then again, we're looking at that potential five month period. So it could be a significant amount of time from the time that they've actually been funded and used that money before they have to start paying that amount back. Because you have to know if it's gonna be forgiven or not to even be able to make those payments. So you really have to have that answer from the SBA before uh, you know that. So technically, again, it was said it would be 10 months from the time that you were funded, but now that's backing up because of the fact that you have 10 months to apply and then you have to wait for, you know, the, to find out, is it going to be forgiven or not? Obviously, if it's 100% forgiven, there's no loan to pay back. As if PPP wasn't confusing enough with the exclusions <laughs> and the safe harbor, the time everyone loves is coming sooner rather than later, taxes. Right. What do business owners need to look at as some of the implications of receiving um, this loan, receiving forgiveness? How is that going to affect them? Sure. So one of the things that as of we're recording this, and who knows if this will change, but as of right now, the IRS has said that technically when you received the PPP funds, that's not income. So it's not taxable to you as income. Uh, so everyone was thinking, great, this is money that we're going to have. It's not going to be taxable. Fabulous. However, what they have said is that if you use that money for expenses that are forgiven, you can't write off those expenses. Basically, that means the same thing then. You basically have a higher taxable net profit than you would have if you were able to write off those expenses. So if you had a $50,000 loan, $50,000 is forgiven, that $50,000 of expenses would not be able to be expensed. So you have $50,000 more of net profit that becomes taxable. Depending on where you fall in the tax brackets, of course, that's going to affect how much you have to pay in tax. Another thing that's actually going to be interesting to see how this is handled is if that forgiveness comes in a tax year after you file the tax return. So again, if you have 10 months to apply for forgiveness and it could take another five to find out what's forgiven or what's not, but your tax return is due, are you going to assume it's forgiven and you can't write off those expenses and you pay the higher tax or do you just file it? with the expenses for now and you amend later, it's gonna be really interesting to see what CPAs have to do 
to account for these numbers because when you're going to file your 2020 tax return in 2021, you know, unless you're filing an extension also to file later in the year, some corporations have to file by March. And of course, as individuals and sole proprietors, that due date is April. Uh, without the extension, those are going to be probably being completed before the forgiveness is even determined. So it's going to make an interesting tax year. I mean, it was already hard for CPAs this year with extensions being granted. And instead of having the April deadline, you had till July. And then of course you still had the October deadline. So it seemed like for CPAs this year, the tax year never ended. And I, probably they're going to see that again next year too, because they're going to have filings that have to get postponed until they know if the client is getting forgiveness or if they don't want to have to wait, file that return and then potentially amend. Uh, but the main thing is really to understand that if you get forgiveness, then that is not going to be able to be written off. So I'm encouraging all my clients to talk to their CPAs and see what is better for them. Should they have it as a loan at 1% interest, which you're not gonna find anywhere else and be able to write off all those expenses or do you want to have the forgiveness, but know that you're going to have higher, you know, taxable uh, profit than what your profit and loss report shows in your QuickBooks or whatever accounting system that you're using? Well, thank you, Candy, for covering this ever-changing terrain that is the PPP forgiveness and application. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, I know our listeners appreciate it. I'm sure this is one that you'll find people listen to two, three, four times, <laughs> at least while the information is still relevant if they don't change it again. Exactly. Um, so just the last few questions. Do you have any offers that you'd like to share? Sure. As we were talking about, this is confusing. There's a lot, you know, that's happening and things are ever changing. So if an employer doesn't feel confident in doing this themselves, we are offering uh, services uh, based on the level that they need, you know, is it 3508, 3508EZ, or 3508S. Uh, but we do have the capability to assist those business owners with that. So if anyone wants to reach out to us and have us assist with that, and if they mention that they saw us on this show, we will take 10% off the processing fee uh, for their PPP forgiveness application. Wonderful. And in order to do this and dive into your wealth of knowledge how can our listeners contact you in order to get this started so our website is affordablebookkeepingandpayroll.com it's easier to just type www.a as an apple b as in boy the word and p as in paul.com so www.abandp.com you can find us also on Facebook at Affordable Bookkeeping and Payroll. You can find me on LinkedIn at Candy Messer and we're on Twitter at Affordable BP. And of course, you can reach us also at 310-534-5577 or contact at abandp.com. It's super helpful that you can type that little. I know I was looking up the some blog posts today on A, B, and P just to read and um, and keep up to date with things. And I know every five times I try to type affordable bookkeeping and payroll, I mess bookkeeping up. Bookkeeping has one O. So it's really helpful that you can type a, B, and P dot com, and it right. takes you right there. Yeah, people actually spell bookkeeping wrong most of the time. It's, I think it might be one of the only, you know, English words that actually has three double letters. So there's two O's, yes. two K's, two E's. <laughs> and I always double check that. I'm like, this feels wrong. <laughs> like, why are there so many identical letters in mm -hmm. this? But thank you, spell check. You know, thank you, autocorrect <laughs> right. on my phone. <laughs> So thank you, Candy, for sharing this helpful information, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in today. We hope you found this topic interesting and that it answered some questions about the PPP forgiveness process. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to us at media at abandp.com. And would you please share our show information with those you know? We'd really appreciate your support. Be sure to tune in next time as we cover another important topic. And please remember, you can connect with us on Twitter, 
Facebook, and LinkedIn. And our website is www.abnp.com. Also note that you can find this podcast posted on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to This Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. Have a terrific week.